Antarctica. 14 million square kilometers of snow and ice. In winter, temperatures drop to minus 75 degrees Celsius and winds reach 200 miles an hour. Yet right here, builders are taking on nature by constructing one of the most advanced research centers in the world. One that'll help scientists reveal secrets about the planet's past, as well as its future. It's a little on the chilly side, I'll tell you that, but the quicker we get things done, the better we stay warm, I'll tell you that. Since November 2000, a team of 100 builders have been taking on the elements to build a 78 million pound scientific research station. It'll be the centerpiece of a 15,000 square meter scientific village that, once complete, will be one of the most advanced facilities in the world and one of the most self-sufficient. With its own water treatment plant, advanced climate research center, a mobile drilling rig capable of reaching depths of over one and a half miles, and a state-of-the-art telescope capable of searching for clues to the origins of the universe. Three years into the project, one challenge remains. Building the last three wings of the research station that will provide living quarters, offices, and even a sports hall for 150 workers. It's not just the Antarctic temperatures which make the task daunting. Exterior work can only be carried out for 110 days each year before the sun disappears for the winter. Completely cut off from the outside world, lives will depend on these buildings being able to survive the long months of winter darkness. So after the next three long years of back-breaking work, the structure will face an in-depth examination before it can be declared open. We've been given a list of things to correct, and in the process of doing that, we found a few other things. Yeah, fix that ceiling. Ten days of grueling, painstaking inspections, known as Hell Week. November 2002. Work begins on the final three wings of the research station, raising the steel framework. It's the first stage of a building project that will last three years. 75 builders are working shifts to make the most of the Antarctic summer's 24 hours of daylight. You don't want me welding over yonder? Yeah, after you get the scaffold set up and get all the bolts and all the tools up. 340 tons of steel must go up over the next two summers. Let's get fired up, boys! <laughs> Woo! Come on! The steel workers have the hardest job on the project, working with icy metal and exposed to freezing winds. It's like no one else on the planet because the temperature gets to you. Even the metal is affected by the cold. It shrinks unevenly in the sub-zero temperatures. Engineering finesse must be replaced with something a little more basic. Banging on things with sledgehammers to make them fit, and uh, it's kind of rough, and it's not fine finish work, I can tell you that. <laughs> and when a part doesn't fit or gets damaged, the nearest spare is literally on the other side of the world. Improvisation is key. There's always a lot of plan B going on. A lot of cutting and welding, and we'll get a design from the engineers, and we'll just have to fabricate it here on site. Whatever it takes to get it all done. We're not going to miss that schedule, is what we've been told, so... The men in charge of the schedule are construction managers Carlton Walker and Jerry Marty. For them, starting work on the final stage of the project is a moment to savor. We first started talking about this thing in 94, 95. We were drawing it on the back of napkins. Out here, it's a full-time job. We work together off-season, on-season, putting together the planning to make sure that all this steel and all these these panels are here on time. Meticulous organization is essential. The whole project requires 40,000 tons of construction materials and building equipment. All needs to be transported a distance of nearly 12,000 miles. And Jerry and Carlton get just one shipment a year. This far from civilization, any wrong or misordered part could cause delays running into millions of pounds. November 2004. 
The first flight of the season is about to land at the South Pole Station airfield. Each September, a freighter leaves Port Wainini, California, and heads for Littleton, New Zealand. Once there, an icebreaker clears a channel for the ship to steam onto the largest port in the Antarctic, McMurdo. The unloaded freight is then transferred onto round-the-clock flights to complete the final 900-mile leg of the journey. Waiting for the flight are a team of cargo handlers. They need to be on the strip well in advance, prepared to unload the plane as soon as it lands. Operations manager, Liesl Schirmtanner, has already been waiting 15 minutes. When the planes come right after one another, you might be out here for five hours straight, right? You're working hard, but you're not doing a lot of moving around. Fortunately, when it gets busy, cargo handlers have one of the most physical jobs at the pole. When the planes get here, it's time to rock and roll, and that's what we do, we rock and roll. We have a lot of planes coming in today. They'll be coming in about 45 minutes apart with a lot of big, heavy, dumb stuff. You gotta really hustle to get that going. There's a lot to do. Even though these Hercules LC-130s can carry a payload of 12 tons, the ground crew will still have to shift nearly a thousand flight loads to keep the project on target and the builders equipped with the supplies they desperately need. And in the summer months, flights land 24 hours a day. It's just totally cool to hop in a big rig like this and to move around stuff that, you know, a hundred people can move by hand. It's awesome. I love it. The builders have completed the steel framework of the polar station's final three wings. Now the team are starting to work on the next stage, attaching the insulated paneling. But there's a problem. A bulldozer and crane are not working. They're not broken, they're frozen. Without a crane, construction can't continue. Yep. Right, right. The nearest garage is 900 miles away, so every mechanical problem needs to be fixed on site. Mechanics have developed a specially designed gas heater to warm up frozen engines. Although it churns out enough heat to warm five houses, in this extreme cold, it's barely big enough to heat the engine above freezing. After several hours, the driver attempts to start the engine. In the intense cold, even the simplest task is far from easy. But if it's so difficult, why build here at all? For the American National Science Foundation, who are funding this project, the answer is simple. They're convinced Antarctica holds the key to answering many of the big scientific questions affecting our planet. For astronomers, the pristine atmosphere and location at the Earth's axis gives them a perfect place to look for new stars. Physicists are hoping to find subatomic particles trapped in the permanent ice sheet. And the cold and remoteness is perfect for climatologists investigating our impact on the planet. Because of its ideal location, scientists have wanted to establish a permanent base here for over 50 years. The first expedition to reach the South Pole was led by Norwegian Roald Amundsen in 1911, followed a few months later by the ill-fated British explorer, Captain Robert Scott. But the first attempt to build a station was until October the 31st, 1956, when a US airplane landed at the Pole for the first time. Within days, 24 Navy servicemen had constructed prefabricated huts out of canvas and wood. But snow quickly took its toll. After just 10 years, the station was engulfed by 10-meter drifts, forcing the Navy to brace their huts with extra supports. 
In 1970, construction began on a new center, an aluminum dome designed to withstand 200 miles per hour winds. The idea was that the snow would flow over the structure without settling. Named in honor of the first explorers 65 years earlier, the Amundsen Scott Station transformed the South Pole into a scientific hotspot. Filled to capacity almost from the day it opened, the research carried out has affected us all. It was here in 1986 that scientists first established the link between the hole in the ozone layer and man-made pollution. With a diameter of 50 meters and a height of 16 meters, the dome could provide 23 people with living quarters, laboratories, library, communication center, medical center, post office, and a general store. It even had its own pub. Our only little bar at 90 South. It's got a little bit of character. <laughs> but although it looked high tech, the dome was little more than a glorified tent sheltering prefabricated huts. Even a trip to the bathroom could mean walking through temperatures of minus 45 degrees. Built with 1970s technology and building codes, it's now hopelessly obsolete. And the dome had one even bigger flaw. Its smooth shape did not deflect snow drifts. The only protruding object in a vast flat landscape, it acted as a windbreak, building up massive drifts that constantly threatened to crush it. Clearing snow became a never-ending and energy-intensive job, using 60,000 litres of fuel at a cost of 17,000 pounds a year. With its replacement now half-built, the dome's interiors are finally being dismantled. 15-year veteran of the pole station, B.K. Grant, has mixed feelings. Strange to get attached so much to a thing or a place, but without this, sure, there's a new station, and that will be a great thing. And for science, it's going to be absolutely phenomenal. I mean, the the capabilities that we're going to provide are they're just so far beyond anything down here. But this was home, and that'll probably be home for the next bunch. The designers of the new center learned much from the failings of the dome using the latest technology to tame the destructive power of the Antarctic snow. Their plan is to construct a station eight times as big as the dome and not on the ground, but in midair. The building will sit atop reinforced steel columns almost four meters high, allowing the snow to pass freely underneath and preventing drifts from building up and burying the station. The walls themselves are angled. Like aeroplane wings, they will force air passing beneath the station to increase in speed, blowing any settled snow away. And the structure will have another fail-safe mechanism to protect it from the elements. Although the Antarctic receives just 23 centimeters of snow each year, the designers knew that at these temperatures, it will never melt. So when the snow finally does reach the floor line of the new station, the building can be jacked up 